Brian Von VA here, everybody. Welcome back to Santa's Little Sack. And that sounded a little bit wrong, but that is perfectly fine because we, you, me, all of us are going to put our hands down into the stocking stuffers, the little goodie bags, the grab bags once again to find some itty bitty little gems and little bits of happiness or sarcastic irony either way that said if you have a little bit of christmas cheer you'd like to put down in your stocking here please do so in the comments below and until then welcome to random DD story grab bag part two so our group is trying to do the smart thing sneaking into luskin rather than walking in through the gate and possibly getting identified as being from neverwinter we had a number of different ways to get in, most of which were pretty easy but required some half-decent rolls to pull off. <laughs> we did not do easy in this party. Also, we had an artifact on us that, in the wrong hands, could potentially destroy the world. So there's that. I like how casual that was. <laughs> our decision? Scale the wall near the slums, where the guards patrolled the least. Well, aside from our 800-pound, 9-foot-tall animated bronze statue, they just went statue mode and rode in our cart. And the NPC who was sent along to help us infiltrate Luskin made sure Bear made it inside safely. So, we head over to the wall. Now, the guards don't patrol this area as often for two reasons. One, it's the wall next to the slums. Two, it's 50 feet tall, where the walls in the rest of the city are 20 feet tall. It's going to be a tall order, <laughs> no pun intended, knee slapper, getting up there. But, we do have a 60 foot rope a grappling hook, and a barbarian. Our barbarian, Horus, threw the grappling hook up to the top of the wall. Roll damage. Ah, uh, damage? On a grappling hook? Uh, what do I even roll? He rolled whatever the DM had him roll, and then Horus climbed up the rope. When he got to the top, he realized why the DM had him roll damage. <laughs> I'm excited. Horus had impaled a guard with the grappling hook, and pulled it nearly completely through his chest. The only reason Horus made it up the wall was that the guard was pulled against the wall and his spine was still intact long enough for Horus to get up. <laughs> and as soon as Horus got to the top, before he could stop and reattach the rope somewhere else, the next person coming up grabbed it and started their climb, pulling the guard's rib cage out through the hole in his chest. <laughs> Everyone on the ground had to roll a deck save to avoid the falling rib cage. Our bard, Q, she rolled a one. The rib cage landed on her head and got caught in her tiefling horns, giving Q a rib cage at. Q was not amused. Horus grabbed the corpse of the guard and tossed it over the wall, where Q cast silence to quiet the landing. Unfortunately, another guard saw Horus there and came over to investigate. He assumed that Horus must have been smuggling something and asked what he was smuggling. Now in Luskin, smuggling isn't a huge issue so long as the guards get their cut. So Horus said, look for yourself, and pointed over the wall. <laughs> and as soon as the guard looked, he kicked him over the wall. Eventually, the rest of the party finally made their way up and got into the city. <laughs> so in a One Piece D&D game, my party was trying to obtain a devil fruit in an area taken over by a group of marines which included a high-ranking member of the organization. So, instead of directly dealing with them, we instead climbed onto trees and waited for eight hours, waiting for the Marines to either leave, collapse from exhaustion, or switch shifts. We did this with the knowledge that they would be unable to obtain the Devil Fruit without the blood of my fighter, Norm L. Mack. <laughs> oh, 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 no. Norm's back, whose family had been guarding the Devil Fruit. So once the Marines had been sufficiently exhausted and we had sufficiently completed a treehouse complete with a hot tub and jacuzzi, we dropped down from the trees, took them by surprise, and spent every resource we had to push the DM's mini boss off a 60 foot cliff. During an introductory campaign for a few players brand new to Dungeons and Dragons, I had them fighting as gladiators in an arena. I did so to teach them combat mechanics as well as intrigue checking things out before a match for the ability to cheat, talking to NPCs to maybe get some inside information from someone who was betting on them. Long story short, one of my players was successful in the final trial. His opponent lies beaten and broken before him on both knees and a show of surrender. The king rises from his throne in the stands 
and raises his hand to give the thumbs up or down to judge the opponent's faith. The king hesitates and looks toward the player. The new player looked unsure about how to respond, so I reminded him that he could do anything in this world, that he should treat it like the real world, where your actions may have consequences and can define who you are. So what does he choose to do? Does he request that his opponent be spared? Does he refuse to make the call and express his defiance towards the system? Maybe charge the king who lays unguarded before him. I stick my finger in his wounds and diddle it around. <laughs> In hindsight, he may have taken my mantra about being able to do anything a bit too on the nose. Still, I now use this as my go-to example for new players about how they can truly do anything because that one guy even did that. Also, I could just imagine um, if that's what this, this uh, player would do in real life, maybe uh, I, I wouldn't go sleep over their house ever. The party, consisting of a human fighter, a satyr barbarian, a human cleric warlock, and a Hexblood Ranger. They had been on the run for the past few sessions, trying to gather a powerful set of magic armor in which to hopefully defeat the big bad evil guy, an ancient red dragon with red scales tinged with bronze, named Sirap, which is pronounced Sirap. He had been after the party for a while, several times coming close to ending their quest, such as when he attacked a ship they were on, which exploded when grain dust in the hold was ignited. For a while, they thought they had lost him, but he turned up again. This time, the party had found the third piece of the armor needed in the set, and they were greeted by none other than Sirap at the entrance who had fought their blue dragon companion. Luckily, they managed to escape, but their blue dragon companion sacrificed his life in the process. This moment devastated the party, as the blue dragon who had been with them for a while in disguise had been a friend to the satyr barbarian the one she trusted the most among the party. Now that the backstory is out of the way, we can get to the moment where the party realized that the true extent of what Sirap was capable of. Previously, he had made contact with the party to almost taunt them, but never before, all at once. The party awoke in a lit cavern with molten lava burning all around the perimeter. Piles of gold and other valuables reflected in the soft yellow glow cast by the molten rock. The party honestly had no idea how they had come to be here and immediately started to look for a way out. When they couldn't find it, Sirap appeared, much to the barbarian's annoyance at this point, which had been building steadily since the beginning of the campaign. He wanted the armor that they collected from several locations, but the barbarian refused. She was having none of it and was angry about the loss of the blue dragon companion. Sirap didn't see things from her perspective. Instead, changed his offer. Instead of the rest of the party going free, potentially, he now suggested that if the barbarian gave him the armor, she could choose one of the group to leave alive. Alternatively, he offered that if any of the other party members would be willing to give him what he wants, they can go. To summarize, either the barbarian chooses someone to leave alive or the rest of the party save themselves at the cost of the group. It was a tense moment. The players and characters were equally uncertain. Sirap, up to this point, had only spoken to the party. No combat. For the next while, there was some unsuccessful attempts at bartering with him, to avoid making the decision, of course. Eventually, however, the cleric gave in and decided that he needed to focus on solving his own problems and demanded the rest of the group give him the armor. At the same time, the ranger attempted his own bargain, which ultimately got turned around on him. He offered his service which Sirap countered by saying, speaking draconic, that none of the rest of the group understands, that if he can kill the barbarian, he'll consider it. The party relented and accepted that the cleric needed to be the one to go, more on him later, and the ranger agreed to Sirap's terms on the condition that the fighter be freed as well. The cleric vanished before their eyes, as did the fighter. The ranger and barbarian proceeded to fight one another, until the barbarian eventually managed to kill the ranger. Sirap at this point, still had done nothing to harm the group. Then, when the barbarian all thought it was over, the fighter reappeared and stabbed her in the back. As it turned out, the fighter hadn't vanished, but instead been made invisible and unable to speak. Sirap then cast Dominate Person upon her, which she failed to say. Not knowing what was going on, she saw that the fighter had a strange look in her eyes. With each slash, the fighter cried out, 
The two characters had become almost like sisters during the course of the campaign and continuously said, I'm sorry, I can't control myself, I'm sorry. The barbarian could have fought back, but instead dropped her axe unwilling to harm her and was killed by the fighter's sword. At the end of all of this, all that remained was the fighter and Syrup. All she heard him say was, Interesting. Very interesting. I have learned much from this. Then the party awoke, where they had last been. The cleric had been punching the sand while the others had been unconscious, angry that he hadn't seen the illusion and that he had been the one to sacrifice them all for his own life. The party didn't speak for a time, troubled by what had just occurred. Syrap had defeated the party, not with claws and teeth, destructive magics, or even the dragon's legendary breath weapon, but with words and a single charm spell. As one of my players told me after the session, the session for me established how dangerous a villain Syrap is. He's cold, calculating, and worst of all, patient. He's completely unlike the stereotypical red dragons, which scares me as I don't know what he might do to our characters. I like him, but this encounter makes me scared of what he'll potentially do next. I need to know more. If, there, if you're out there, tell us more about Syrap, please. Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier here. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and to ring that bell to get notified whenever we post a brand new video, a short, which is rare, or in case we go live. Of course, we don't go live, but there's a rare chance we might do it. That being said, if you'd like to actually catch me, Brian Von Vier, your lovely narrator and voice actor from Ohio, live, you're more than welcome to do so on Twitch, which I, I all want to see you guys there because... Honestly, I, I planned on doing some cool stuff for everybody to celebrate Mr. Ripper hitting 200,000 subscribers soon. And I just want to share my version of the love and fun because everybody seems to love it. And I just want to do something cool for all of you. So I hope to see everybody coming over to my Twitch, Brian Von VA on Twitch. You can look in the link in the description below. That is my website. Come say hi to me. Check out all my voice work. Do what you want to do. And of course, at the very end, I just want to say this. The grab bag. The little sweet stocking stuffers. These random amalgamation of stories. I really like them. I love them. In fact, to me, there's, these are some of the best stories I've read. Because they're so different from what we normally get. They're not related to a random thread of just like, What have you done to save yourself today? Or how evil have you been? No, this is just an amalgamation of beautiful, amazing, inspirational, or sometimes sad stories. Like the last one with Syrap. That got me so hyped that I truly want to play D&D right now. I just don't have a group to do it with. So to all of you out there playing D&D or DMing, I'm really proud of all of you for having such a wild, vivid, amazing imagination. Bringing stories to life like this is just, is beautiful to me. I, I love it. It brings a lot of love to my inner child. And I really hope to see all of you out there, boys, girls, ladies, gentlemen, everyone and anyone in between, enjoying the imagination in your soul and letting it free because who knows maybe one of your stories years down the line will be read by yours truly and it might inspire a whole new generation go for it don't worry about what one or two people might like or dislike do what you like because i'm certainly gonna love it i love you all be safe be happy we'll see you next time bye for now